Good evening. Um, first of all, I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the International Museum of Women and Book Passage to tonight's very special speaker series event. We are truly honoured to be presenting Ingrid Betancourt as our speaker this evening because her work echoes themes that are truly important to us as the International Museum of Women. She embodies a truly global perspective, and she has not only an incredible personal story, but she represents untold stories of thousands of women and men in Colombia and around the world. Her work engages, moves, and provokes new global audiences, and she's playing a real leadership role in advancing human rights, particularly the human rights of captives and hostages. All those dimensions echo our work and our priorities at the International Museum of Women. We empower women's voices, self-expression and creativity, and we use those voices to catalyse interest and engagement in women's human rights causes around the world. And we do it through a museum that is completely virtual, with exhibitions that are online, available 24-7 in multiple languages to audiences around the world. You may have seen the images from our slideshows that were available as you came into the room this morning, this evening. Um, those give you an incredible snapshot of just some of the content that is available on our website. They're drawn from an exhibition called Economica, Women in the Global Economy, which gives you an incredible snapshot of the ways in which women are empowered as change agents economically in different countries around the world. Images from women in Qatar, who are forging forward with new visions of business leadership in a society that had not traditionally valued their contributions. Images of women in China, who are migrant workers in factories, who really struggle to assert their identity and their power and their reproductive choices in a difficult and often alien environment. We are a unique place where women worldwide can express themselves, inspire others, and imagine ways that the world could be different. And I know that's exactly what you're going to experience here tonight. Before we begin the programme, I'd like to take a moment to thank the people who've made this evening possible. First of all, to the staff, the volunteers, and the board members of the International Museum of Women. Thank you all. Without your passion and your commitment and your hard work, none of this would be possible. I'd like to thank Book Passage, who are our major partner this evening. Thank you so much for your collaboration around this very special evening. And our other key event partners, the Bay Citizen, the Global Fund for Women, Human Rights Watch, ITVS, and Spark. Of course, I have to thank the current sponsors of our online exhibition, Economica. Those leading sponsors are Catholic Healthcare West, Wells Fargo, Visa, and Charles Schwab. And there are two sponsors who deserve our very special thanks this evening. Um, and first of all, I want to invite um, a representative from Wells Fargo to say a few words. We're so deeply grateful for their support and their sponsorship of our Extraordinary Voices, Extraordinary Change speaker series, including tonight's programme. Please welcome Cheatham Jenser from Wells Fargo Regional Wealth Management. Thank you, Claire. Thank you for welcoming me here tonight. Wells Fargo is so pleased to participate in bringing wonderful programs such as IMOW's Extraordinary Voices, Extraordinary Change speaker series to San Francisco. We're delighted to partner with an organization so committed to illustrating how women can and are making a difference in the world. 
Not many of us can understand what it means to have one's in life interrupted so suddenly and for an indefinite period of time. And Ms. Betancourt is a living example of the power of endurance. So thank you in joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Cheetham. Um, I also want to say a huge thanks to Charles Schwab for donating this wonderful space and facility for this evening's program. And, and a huge thanks to the, um, the staff here at this facility who've been really incredible and helpful in making this happen tonight. So before I introduce our moderator and our speaker, um, a little bit of housekeeping. First of all, could you all please check you have turned your cell phones off? Um, I also want to let you know that question cards will be available for those of you who want to ask questions from Ingrid Beckencourt this evening. We have volunteers who will be walking the room with question cards available if you want to pose a question. And our moderator, Jean, will pass them on um, and ask a number of them this evening. Now I'd like to invite tonight's speakers to the stage. Ingrid Bettencourt will be in conversation with Jean Carstensen. Jean is the managing editor of The Bay Citizen, and she's somebody that I know has a true passion for women's human rights, um, for raising women's voices, and for telling stories about women around the world, particularly from Latin America. She lived in Latin America for six years, covering human rights and women's issues for a women's radio station. As a former managing editor of Salon, she was one of the journalistic team that helped expose the Abu Ghraib files. As a managing editor at The Bay Citizen, which is a non-profit news organization here in San Francisco, she covers key civic and cultural issues and produces the Bay Area pages of the New York Times. Jean's skills and experience make her the perfect moderators for this evening's conversation, and I'd like to welcome her tonight. Now, I'm truly honored to introduce tonight's speaker. She is the writer of an astonishing, moving, and deeply accomplished book, Even Silence Has an End, My Six Years of Captivity in the Colombian Jungle. I finished reading our speaker's book over a month ago, and it's really haunted me and lived with me ever since. And when I read it, there were two questions that really continued to live with me. Um, and those are, what would it be like to be a mother and to be away from your children for six years and have no idea when you are going to see them again? And what would it be like to be a public voice as an agent of change and not have that voice for six years? Because our speaker is somebody who has a truly powerful voice and who has exerted it as a writer, as a political figure, as an anti-corruption advocate and a human rights activist. She was a celebrated politician and senator in Colombia and was campaigning as a candidate in the Colombian presidential elections at the time of the kidnap that precipitated this book. I was lucky enough to meet her early this evening and I know that she's not only a voice for her recent remarkable and unimaginable personal experience of captivity, she's also a voice for a far bigger vision for the human rights of women and men around the world. As she said to me, Fighting for freedom is fighting for human rights. I am truly honored that this evening we're giving voice to Ingrid Betancourt. Welcome. Well, hello. And um, it's just a real pleasure to be able to speak to you this evening. And, uh, I thought that we would, um, I want to discuss your incredibly moving memoir and then leave a little bit at the, of time at the end um, to maybe talk about some of your future plans. Um, but I wanted to 
go back to January 2002, um, before uh, you were taken prisoner, and just uh, remind us what you were doing. You were running for president of Colombia. Yes, um, thank you. <laughs> and thank you all for being here with us. Uh, it was a Saturday, uh, 23rd of February, 2002. And I was um, in this presidential campaign and I was heading to a town, a little village called San Vicente del Caruán. It was uh, a place where the government was holding uh, the peace talks with the FARC, which was this rebel group, communist rebel group, that after uh, uh, kidnapped me. Mm. I arrived to Florencia. I, I took a plane from Bogota to Florencia, and Florencia was a town in the south of Colombia, uh, from which I had to take the road to San Vicente. It was a trip of two hours uh, in, a, in a road that was a fairly good road. When I arrived, um, the airport was militarized, and um, there was at that moment a, a, uh, a you know, a, a problem. Um, the peace talks had ended abruptly. Uh, there was a crisis. And uh, the president of Colombia had decided to go to the same place as I was at the same time. And so the airport was militarized, waiting for the president to come. And there were helicopters flying uh, between San Vicente and Florencia every 30 minutes. So um, after uh, discussions with the military um, that had offered me to go to San Vicente in a helicopter and afterwards they said that they had received the order not to take me, I decided to go like I had planned uh, by the road. and. We received the order from Bogota that my escorts couldn't come with me. Mm -hmm. So I was facing this dilemma, um, if I should go or just cancel the trip. I had received a, a phone call from the mayor of San Vicente. He was a, a person from my party. And he had asked me not to cancel the trip because the population in San Vicente was uh, frightened that because they had participated in the peace talks with the FARC, the paramilitaries, which were the, which were the enemies of, of the FARC, they were the rebels but of the extreme right, would take revenge on the population and would kill people. So they thought that my presence could help in making like a shield or, or at least um, make the world know that they, they were at risk and by knowing and, and putting the, the situation publicly, uh, they, they would feel more protected. The thing is that when I received the, the, the news that my uh, bodyguards couldn't come with me, I thought, well, this is a manipulation of the government who doesn't want me to get to San Vicente at the same time as the president is going to San Vicente. I was at the opposition at that time. And I thought if I, if I, Accept not to go because they withdraw my security. That means that every time the government will want to prevent me from going somewhere, they will just withdraw my security and there's no more campaign. The, the government will be in control of, of my campaign. So I decided that I had to go for, for all those reasons. And I took the road, I passed a military checkpoint, and I stumbled in a group of armed guys, rifles, boots. And the place was militarized all over. There were soldiers all over the place. But I had been warned to always check the boots of the armed persons that I would encounter, because if uh, they had leather boots, that was the Colombian army. But if they had rubber boots, that was the guerrilla. And those guys had rubber boots. So then I knew I was in front of the FARC. So you were taken into captivity. How long was it before you started to realize that 
this was going to be a fairly long ordeal. It took me a year to just understand that it was just going to be very long. At first, well, at first I thought it was a mistake because I had been talking with the leaders of the FARC and I had had lunch with them and we had been talking about politics and for me it was it was impossible to just think that these guys could be thinking in abducting me. So once I was abducted, I, the first hours I was expecting that there would be an order to release me. And then the day after my, my abduction, um, there was a press release from the FARC saying that they would give to the government a deadline of a year to negotiate my freedom. They wanted to trade me um, for prisoners, for, for uh, guerrillas that were in, caught in jail. But after that year, they would execute me. So, well, from that moment on, I thought that I had to escape before that deadline would be met because I didn't want to stay there to see they were going to, to do what they had threatened us to. Uh, so I, I tried to escape many times, but it was only after that year that I realized that they didn't kill me and they hadn't negotiated me and that perhaps that would be long. Mm -hmm. I never thought it was going to be six years. And you were taken captive uh, with Clara Rojas, who I think was your campaign manager at yes. the time, and um, the two of you tried to escape twice. More than that. I, I Even more it, than that? Yes. Wow. In the book, I just talk about two times that we tried to escape, but we tried to escape, yeah, more, four times. I mean, how did you, I mean, you must have been so afraid of what you were going to confront. Uh, you had no supplies. You must have been worried they would shoot you if they caught you, but yet you kept trying to escape. Yes. Well, the, the very difficult thing was to learn how to survive in the jungle. And that was not easy. I mean, I was a, uh, Clara and I, we were actually uh, women that would live in the city. <laughs> we didn't have a clue of how to just survive in the jungle. So um, we tried, the first time we tried to escape, uh, we, we managed to get out of the control of the guards and we walked for, for the whole night and in the morning, we were just thirsty. And the incredible thing is that there was water all over the place. I mean, there was a river, there was creeks, but that water was muddy and with mosquitoes. And we couldn't think we could drink that thing. Of course, after six years, <laughs> I drank everything. <laughs> I mean, that was not, even a problem, but, but this is only to say how difficult it was to just, you know, um, ponder the, the, the risk and just learn how to survive. And I thought that, you know, in, 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 the, in the life we live, uh, we, we have so many warnings uh, because you're gonna get sick. Don't, don't, it's raining, you cannot go out because you're gonna get sick. And you uh, don't drink this because that's gonna make you sick. And I was, you know, with all those things in my brain, and I was, there was rain all the time, and, and I never, I never, I mean, I'm here. <laughs> I survived all those things. One of the, there's many excruciating scenes that you describe in the book, of course, but uh, one that I was very moved by is just the ongoing difficulty you had in your relationship with, with Clara and how you were put together in such close circumstances that I think it would drive any two humans um, over the edge. And um, it seems like this was a very challenging uh, circumstance. You would try and escape, and then you would um, be recaptured. And uh, eventually, if I understand uh, correctly, you, the relationship just couldn't couldn't survive this. Why do you think that is? Because on the other hand, she was the only kind of person you had there. Well, I think 
It's, it's very human, I think. Um, we, were, we had worked together, uh, and we would socialize once in a while. We would go and have lunch. And, but we were never, I mean, it's very different to, to, to work with somebody and then to be put in a cage with somebody and live 24 hours a day with that person. Um, we didn't want to be there. We didn't want to be together there. And we were forced to be together there. And it was, it was difficult just to, to uh, be sharing uh, those endless hours without no space. I mean, it's difficult for people, I think, to realize what space means in our life because we have it. But just picture yourself in a plane or in a bus or in a train. And you're there for a couple of hours, and you have your little space at your seat, and you paid for it, and it's yours. That's your space. And then somebody comes along, and he's a little too big or whatever, and he takes a little more space. That he, he, and then you feel, you feel threatened. You feel that, and you need to just make feel the other that that's your space and that he shouldn't be so close. Because you don't want to be close to people you don't want to be close to. And, well, that's what's happening to us. I mean, we were forced to sleep together, to bathe together, to go to the chantas together, the chantas where the toilets, the holes dig in the ground. And we had to go together and wait for the other. I mean, just picture the scene. I mean, it was, it was, it was very difficult. And after a while, Little things began eroding the relationship. Don't touch me. Why do you cough at night? Why do you move? Uh, I don't want to escape. But we have to escape. No, I don't want to escape. Do it yourself. I cannot leave you. Well, uh, I'm not going with you. Well, uh, I mean, it was, it was just a nightmare. It was a horrible nightmare. And we were facing our frustration, we were facing our sorrow, our pain, and it came to a point where the only distance we could make between the two of us was silence. Mm -hmm. And that silence became a huge wall of misunderstanding. And I think also we, we took different uh, paths because my obsession was to get back to my children. I wanted to get back to my life. I would have done anything to just be able to, to, to get back home. But she, she was a single woman. She had other priorities probably in her life. She, she, getting back home wasn't, she, she thought we couldn't just get out of the jungle. She thought it was an insane to just continue trying to escape. And she wanted to just be easy, try to just live what she had to live without, uh, on top of that, the adrenaline and the stress and the, the horrible thing to prepare escape, because escaping was another nightmare. I mean, it was very hard to just confront the, 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 the to be so frightened when you have to take the decision that you're going to, to go. And of course, that man. We, we were taking a risk that was huge, not only of being executed if they captured us, but of dying in the jungle because we didn't know how to survive. So, so that is what happened, and it was human. And, um, but you see, I think that the relationship with Clara, of course, uh, was very difficult, and it, it was traumatic for her and for me. But I have the hope that uh, with time, with, uh, you know, time is a healer, uh, we will be able to just, to just talk again. Mm -hmm. Because when I think about Clara, I really think about her like my sister. A sister which, with whom I had all the problems I could imagine. But that's the way it happens in, in a family. I mean, Clara and I, we didn't choose to be together. And you don't choose your siblings. You, you just, you know. 
Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but you are together, living things together. And that's what makes the bondage in a family. And here with Claire, it was the same. So um, I think that, you know, this is a, an energy that has to flow in a very positive way. So, of course, uh, later you were joined with a larger group of prisoners, and so these human relations got even more complicated, it seems. And um, you write really eloquently of <clears throat> how the FARC um, were, were able to sort of humiliate you and manipulate the group in ways that made it very difficult uh, for you all to get along. Um, I was wondering um, if, you could, if you could talk about that a little bit and, and also the unique role that you were in as the most famous, uh, to put it in those words, you know, prisoner there and how that affected your relationships with the other prisoners. Yes. Uh... <clears throat> I think that <clears throat> being a hostage is um, is a very um, damaging situation for your psyche because we are we are the choices we make. This is how we know who we are because when we're confronted to situations and we make some choices, <clears throat> then we know really who we are. When you when you don't have freedom, you don't make any choices. And then the compass of who you are uh, is not clear anymore, and you lose, you lose that sense of, of identity. So the identity thing was uh, a very critical issue for all the hostages. The identity <clears throat> works in human beings in relationship with, with the others. That's how we we know who we are, it's in our relationship with others. And this relationship goes through all kinds of things. Space is a clear um, relationship uh, you know, issue. Um, food, because uh, that's when you are together, when you eat. Here we were parked in a, in, in, in a prison that they had built in the middle of the jungle <clears throat> with uh, barbed wires and, and uh, watchtowers in every corner, guards, rifles, 24 hours a day, and 10 people packed in that very small space. People that had nothing to do with each other. Nothing to do. We, we didn't know each other. We didn't want to be there with each other. We had different backgrounds, different cultures, different everything. And there we were sharing that space, and sharing the lack of everything. And to give you an example, <clears throat> when, the <clears throat> when the pot with the food would come, in the first days of, of this new life together, we would be very civilized, and we would just, you know, the guys would say, you know, ladies first, and we're, we would go and serve ourselves, and it would be. But after two weeks, that thing would... The big guys were there in the pot the first, and they wanted to serve them, and they would have all kinds of excuses saying, we are big, we need more food. And well, there was no more food. The, the pot was what it was, and we need time to eat from that thing. And there were ones who were explaining to the others that they had the right to have more food. I mean, it, it was a very difficult situation. Add to this that uh, we were fed by the uh, guerrillas, not only with little amounts of food, but also with gossip. They would use the guards to talk to some of us and to tell them horrible things about the others. Like, oh, you know what? This person said this about you. Or uh, this person thinks, or, or all kind of information that would trigger confrontation between the hostages. And the strategy was very clear. They wanted to divide us in order to prevent us to do things together, like, for example, escaping together. So they didn't 
want to have uh, a leader. They didn't want to have uh, somebody putting things together and moving the, the, the prisoners. So for them, uh, giving privileges to ones and not to others was also a strategy to confront. Because when, for example, we, we all were in bad shape and we were all ill in, in some sort or another. And they would give medicine only to one guy or to two guys. And the others, we were like, could I have an aspirin? Could I have an antibiotic cream because I, this is infectious? or Nothing. But the other guy would have everything. So of course it creates, you know, a, a, I mean, here you have a problem because you begin hating the guy who's having the privilege of, of having everything because you, you think that that person is just the traitor. He's, he's having this treatment because he is giving information about the rest of the group. And so there you have the division and there you have the war because you have, the, the, you need trust to be able to live and cohabitate with people. And then when you don't have that trust, then you, you begin having problems. On top of that was the problem that one of us was more known than the others. Uh, and that was me. Uh, whenever we would hear in the radio news about our situation, it was my name that would pop up. And that was not good. Because it irritated the others. Because they, they, they were just, you know, bitter, knowing that always it was one name that was the one who was recalled in the news. And so they became aggressive. Some of them, not all of course, but some became very aggressive. And they would turn up the radio and they would say, who do you think you are? You think you're better than us because you're in the radio? So you are the little princess because you're the presidential candidate? And here I was <laughs> trying to tell them, look, I don't want to be a celebrity among hostages. I mean, this is not something that I'm looking for. I cannot do anything about this. I'm not calling the journalist to give me a, an interview. I cannot control this. But at least it can help us. It can just, I mean, if they're talking about the situation, it will help all of us. It was very, you know, painful for me to, to just have this kind of of arguments with my fellow hostages. But I think I didn't understand the real problem, you see, because I think that I wasn't sensitive enough for their ordeal. I, I, could, I didn't understand that because we were all suffering this identity crisis, the fact that it was only my name coming up all the time, of course it hurt them. Because it was another denial of their identity. It was like, like if they didn't exist, if they didn't, like if their pain was not taken into account. And it took me really a long time to just understand that, that it was normal for them to have this kind of resentful attitude uh, towards me. If I had understood that before, perhaps I would have reacted in another way more positive. But I was in pain and, and I couldn't understand what, you know, I had not evolved in a way that I could be sensitive to the pain of others yet. Could you tell us a little bit more about what the radio meant to you there oh, yes. in those six years? The radio was, was everything. Um, well, today we have all kinds of things. Uh, we have the uh, television, but we have the internet, and we have the iPod and the iPad and everything. And, and we don't understand what, what having one source of communication device means. This was the only thing that would link us with the outside world. We didn't have anything else. And it was not only the thing that we would hear news through those transistors. It was also that in Colombia, because there are so many hostages, there are radio programs devoted to broadcast the message of the families of the hostages. And the families never know if the hostages, the loved ones, are listening to their messages. They cannot know. But they, they do it because 
you never know. Perhaps they will, one day they will hear my message. So every day our families were sending messages. And we were listening to them. And that everyday message was for us the key of survival. Because it was the only moment of love that we would receive during the day. Of course, again, there were those who would receive messages and those who wouldn't. And that also was painful. And that also increased the, you know. Um, and also, we would know through the radio what was happening to us, if there was a negotiation, if there was not a negotiation, what was being discussed uh, between Colombians about us. And I remember once um, we were in this um, prison, and one of my uh, fellow captives, who was very you know, observer, and he had always the last news in the camp. He was the one who was, like, uh, gathering news everywhere. And he came to tell me that uh, he had heard the guards uh, saying that they were going to confiscate all the radios in the camp. And so he went to all, the, all my companions, one by one, and whispered to all of us in secret, be careful, they're going to come, they're going to die, they're going to take the radios. So by the time the guerrillas came to take the radios, I had taken my decision to just hide mine. And believe me, I was in panic. I knew I had to do it, but I was like, I thought I'm going to faint. If they ask me something, I'm going to faint. But I did it, I just hide the radio. So I saw all my companions giving their radios to the, to the guard, handing them over. And when it came to my turn, the guard, of course, said, what about your radio? Give me your radio. And I said, I don't have the radio anymore. It broke. And I threw it some months ago. And I was just, you know, so scared that in my face he could read that I was lying. I was just trying to be as cool as I could, and I have my heart that was going to pop out of my throat. And the guy said, okay. And he went away. And there I was. I kept the radio. But I was, of course, very frightened to just use the radio, because now if the sound of the radio would come, it was... And then I was very scared, because, of course, in the group... There were people that were in touch with the guards and that were telling everything. They were the, what we would call them the sapos, the frogs. And in Colombia, frogs mean the one, the traitor. So we knew there were some traitors be, between us. So uh, then there was this huge discussion between hostages because they decided, some of them, to blackmail me. You have to give us your radio, or we're going to tell the guerrillas that you have a radio. <laughs> and I was like, I cannot believe this is happening. So there was this, you know, we, we, we had a reunion, and I, I was blackmailed by, by my fellow hostages, and they wanted me to hand the radio over to them. And I said, no way. I'm sorry. Why didn't you keep your ra radios? Why... Why do you want me to tell you if I have a radio or I have not a radio? And I'm not going to answer this because I know that here there are people that are going to tell the guerrillas if there's a radio or not. So, so I'm, not, I'm not answering. It came to a horrible discussion. And after a while, the discussion went on, on, on the responsibility factor because I said, supposing that there is a radio, Who's going to share the responsibility if they found the radio? Because if everybody wants to listen to the radio, and that's fine with me, everybody has to share the responsibility if something happens. And so we had this discussion, incredible discussion, saying, oh, no, I, won't, I cannot assume any responsibility. You just hide the radio. I didn't hide the radio. Those kind of discussions. At the end, we finally agreed on sharing the responsibility and sharing the radio. And this was a very important moment because it was a moment of trust. It was the moment where we, we could finally gather 
around something that we could just share and 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 that complicity between all of us was very important in changing the mood of how we were relating to each other. I want to come back uh, to your rescue uh, in a minute, but I want to take a break here and, and ask you about writing the book itself and why you decided to do that. It must have been tremendously difficult. You mentioned to me when we were speaking earlier that you, you wrote it in Wyoming. I couldn't think of a setting more different than what you were writing about, but why did you decide to return to all of this? Well, um, I thought it was important to uh, give a meaning to the years I had back in, in the jungle. I thought that um, I had a, a responsibility of giving testimony for many things that I had witnessed. But then it became, for me, uh, like the only option to, to speak about what had happened. Because once I was freed, I couldn't, um, I just couldn't talk with my children or with my mom about what happened. And it was very weird because we had those times where we were all together after my, my liberation. And they were not, they didn't dare to ask me, to, to ask me questions, but there was those silence and they wanted me to talk and, and I wanted to tell them and then I couldn't, I couldn't because every time I would see in their eyes like the pain and the horror of, of just, of what I was going to tell them because they were frightened to just know what had happened and I couldn't. So I decided to write. And write was, was I, I had to do it in a very isolated um, place. Um, I, I wrote the book in many places, but always in isolation. And, um, and it was very difficult, very painful physically to write. Because as I was writing, I was back in the jungle 100%. I cannot explain to you how intense the recalling was. But what I can tell you is that when I would finish a day of writing, I, I couldn't move. I was exhausted. I had to go and lay down. And I was lucky because my mom was with me and she would pamper me. But, uh, but it was exhausting. And it was all the more exhausting because I had planned to write the book in six months. And I would talk with my fellow hostage and I would talk to them on a daily basis and I would see how they were progressing in their lives. They were getting married, they were having children, and here I was writing back in the jungle every day. And I just, it was hard for me to do it. And then it didn't take me six months. It took me three times more, a year and a half. And it was, it was I mean, whenever somebody would ask me if, if I thought it was a therapy to write, I would say, no, not at all. I think it's just a torture. I don't think it's a therapy. Now I think it's a therapy, because I finished. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, well, you're an internationally recognized leader in, in human rights, and um, you know the world has gone through this experience with you in, in certain ways. And uh, what, what are you going to do with this now? What are your, your thoughts um, about uh, working in this, in this realm of human rights? Well, I think that uh, for me, it's, it comes naturally to just, um, you see, when, when, when I have nightmares at, at night and I wake up, and those nightmares bring me back to the jungle, and I'm just so happy to just wake up and not be there anymore, then immediately, immediately, I have this kind of second thought saying, well, I'm here, but what about the others who are still there? 
And um, I know I cannot do much because uh, I'm not a government. I cannot send troops to go and find them or I cannot negotiate them. I cannot do anything. But when I was in, in the jungle and learning about all what I have shared with you, um, I know that having the names of, of the hostages uh, said, uh, you know, just be vocal about their names, is something that changes uh, many things, even though if they don't, if they're not able to just hear me. Um, for me, words are magic. They, they have that incredible power. I don't know how it functions. But I think that when you say out loud uh, the things that you want to see coming, it happens if, if you just be vocal about them. So today, I would like to share with you, and I know it will resonate in your hearts, the names of some of them, because they're going to be back. They're going to be free. And they're going to be alive. And I'm thinking about Forero, that I would call Forerito, um, Lucho Beltran, Salcedo, Liuardo, Duarte. There are others in other places in the world. Uh, I would like to name Hervé Gesquier and Stéphane Taponier. Uh, two French journalists that uh, are in their 305th day of abduction in Afghanistan. I would like to mention Aung San Suu Kyi. You know about her. But uh, we need her back, and we'll have her back very soon. Um, Gila Chalit. It's a soldier uh, caught by one of the uh, groups in, in um, Palestine. Mm. And let's open our hearts to all those people in South America and in all over the globe that are being abducted for economic reasons, for ransom. I'm talking about old people, grandmothers, grandfathers, uh, people ill, mothers, pregnant women, babies, children. And let's just think about them, thinking that if we want in our hearts to just end this horrible um, crime that is abduction, we, we can, we can uh, achieve it if we really talk about it, and we really take conscience of, of how horrible this is. I want to tell you something. Um, when I was in, in captivity, I would have preferred to die than to continue on living like that. I'm glad I'm back. We're about to, uh, yeah. We're about to uh, move to the section of the evening when we uh, take questions from the audience. I did want to squeeze in just one more, and um, it's it's kind of about um, political situation in Colombia now. And you campaigned with your Oxygen Party on an anti-corruption platform and um, a peace platform, an ecological platform. And I I just wonder where you are now um, and. Uh, Plan Colombia, which is the U.S.-funded military uh, plan, basically pretty um, hardcore to try and, and beat back the FARC and the drug trade militarily. Um, there's some debate going on about sh should the country proceed that way or should the country once again try another peace plan? What is your... Well, of course, the option is always the best is negotiation, of course. But the thing is that I'm not sure the FARC wants to negotiate. 
and I don't know if they want to negotiate something. Because what I saw while I was living amongst them is that they don't have today any political um, reason to be. They, they, they don't have uh, ideas, political ideas to share or to, or to present. They don't have programs. They don't have propositions or proposals. They, they don't have a political agenda. They don't have that. They, they, I think that when they decided that they were going to finance their uh, war with the, the drugs, they just, they just lost their, their, their ideals. And they became drug dealers, drug traffickers. Of course, in an in a, in organization that is a military organization, it, it is a military organization not to fight for a better Colombia, but to keep and preserve their way of living, which is, of course, uh, for them precious. Because with the money they have with the drug trafficking, they are able to buy weapons, and not only weapons. They, they are very powerful people in the territories that they control. And what I think is that if they haven't accepted the offer of negotiating, it's because they have no interest in negotiate. Because what would be for them the outcome of a negotiation? Uh, become senators or running for presidency? They, they don't have any support by the Colombian population. They have no political influence. Being a senator for them is nothing compared to the power they have in their territories. Uh, what is the option for the troops? Becoming taxi drivers in Bogota? That's not something they want. I mean, they have much more living the life they have. So that's why I think the problem today for Colombia is that we don't have the option of negotiating. The only option that is left is to confront them through military means. And I hope they will prove me wrong. And I hope that the new commanders will accept to negotiate. But I really think uh, they're not interested in any negotiation. OK. We're going to um, have a question here from Elizabeth. How did you remember all of the minute details from six years and retell them so vividly? Well, I think that for, for us, for, for the hostage or the ex-hostages, the problem is not to recall. The problem is to forget. We cannot forget. We can, even if we try our best, we cannot forget. And it is brought to our memory in everything we do every day. Um, every single moment of the day, we are reminded that we are so lucky to be back. So, well, that's part of the, of the answer. The other part of the answer is that, of course, you forget things. In six years and a half, you cannot recall everything. I think that what I recall was, was um, related to emotions. I think it's a, an emotional memory more than a factual memory. I think that whenever I was in a situation that I was, uh, that I was confronted with strong emotions, that was seared in, in my brains, in my body, in my, in my skin. And when I think about those moments, I'm just there, back there with everything. I can see, I can see, Everything, the, the moment of the day, the, 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 the rays of sun through the canopy, the, the texture of the air, the sounds, uh, the smells, the, the noises, and of course, the dialogues 
what they would say to me, how I would respond, what I was feeling when I was responding, how it would affect me, how I would suffer. And I think that, in fact, writing was, yes, was therapy because, because I did an exercise that I couldn't have done if I would just have you know, put things aside, which was to go back to those situations that I didn't want to recall because I wasn't comfortable with them. Because sometimes you don't feel that what you did is, is okay. You just want to just ignore them or try to, you know. And sometimes it's good to go back there to those moments where you did something that you're not proud about. Because, because you have to forgive yourself. That's part of the healing process. You have to just accept yourself with your little me to try to be a better you. So, and it's also a good exercise of compassion because once you accept that you're not as per perfect as you think you are, then you, you have this easiness in just, and I think it's, it's so important to forgive the others, to just forgive, let go, just let go, let go. Be in peace with the others. Not always try to, 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 to just feel like a victim, like you're feeling what you're feeling because that person did that to you. Well, perhaps that person had problems and that person had issues and, and perhaps you can also see the things through that person's eye. And then you can also forgive. And, 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 and forgive is, is very important in life. It's, it's the key for freedom. You cannot be truly free if you're chained to your bitterness or if you're chained to your, your hatred or, or your... This is from Shoshana. Did you ever ask yourself why? Why me? What was your answer to that question at the time? And in hindsight, what is your answer to that question now? Well, thank you for that question because I spent years asking that question. Why, 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 why me, why? Until the moment I realized that that was the wrong question. It doesn't matter why, there's no answer for why, or there are too many answers for why. I think the question is how, how to confront the situation you're in, not why, because why, I mean, you, you can answer it the why thing in many, many ways. But it's better to, to, to just question itself in how. Because if there's a how, then there's a purpose of what you're living. Then you have something to, to learn from the situation. Because then perhaps the way you are assuming the situation is not the right one. So the thing is how to confront the difficult moment you're, you're facing. And how is the question you need to answer. I'm going to combine uh, two here because they're related. Uh, what is politics like for women in, Colum in Colombia uh, when you were in office and now? And then somebody else asks if you have plans to run for any government position. Or if not, do you have any organizations you want to work with? Okay. Well, Colombia is a Latin country, so you could expect from Colombia to have a machist attitude towards uh, women in politics. Well, it's very surprising, but it doesn't happen. Colombians are very open to women into politics. Uh, sometimes I was asked why that was the case. A and it's not only in politics. If you, if you look the, the percentage of women in Colombia, uh, in politics, in high um, uh, levels of, for example, in banking or in... Uh, or in public uh, administration, or even in, in, in business, so many women are like at the top of the, of the, of the pyramid. Um, and you could ask yourself, why is it so in Colombia? I think, I mean, it doesn't mean that we don't have to just continue trying to be more and more up there because the gap is still big. But but, but compared to other countries, Colombia is doing fairly good. 
And I think that one of the reasons is because of the war that has been going on. Because there are, Colombia is a society where women have been forced to take the, you know, the handles of, 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 the, of the home in, in, in many ways. Uh, because men are absent. And I think that women in Colombia are, are accustomed to, to be independent and to take their decisions and to fight for them. And I think that's why it reflects on how many women are in leading positions. And how about your political aspirations going forward? Well, I'm so happy to answer that I have none. <laughs> uh, this is another uh, question from the audience. Um, in the past, your approval rating has dropped. Can you speak to why this may have happened and what is your response to people who are questioning some of your motives? Yes, yes, that's true. And it has been very painful for me. Uh, of course, you're never profit in your own land. That happens too. But it's hard for me to, to have to face the situation I'm facing with Colombia. Um, for those who do not know, uh, there was a uh, wind of hatred uh, that targeted me some months ago in Colombia. What triggered this was a claim that I did. Um, there is a law in Colombia that uh, protects the victims of terrorism and that allows the victims of terrorism to claim for compensation. Many of my fellow hostages had done so in Colombia. They had presented their claims. And it was not even in the newspaper. It was nothing. Nobody talked about it. But, but when I did present my claims, um, the government uh, reacted in a very aggressive way, distorting the facts. Because they presented my claim like if they said, Ingrid is attacking in court the soldiers that freed her. And that was a lie. And that was really horrible. Um, it was very difficult for me to defend myself because the media were completely shut. And they were just you know, uh, being like a mouthpiece of the government. It was, it was difficult for me at that moment to understand why the government of Colombia was saying that. Because it was the government that had freed me. Why would they distort the facts in such a manner? And they would present the things in a very awful way, because they would say, Ingrid is uh, suing the, the soldiers of Colombia, and she wants Colombia to pay $6 million for her abduction. She wants to be, get rich with her abduction. Well, you see, the thing is that they could give me that or 100 times more. It won't give me back the six years and a half I lost. So it's very painful. It's very painful, and it's very unfair. Uh, they then uh, tried to you know, uh, mix things together, and they said, how could she pretend to be uh, compensated when she was responsible for her abduction? And that was another baby that they had there. Because you see, when I was abducted, um, the government withdrew my security. And then once I was in the hands of the FARC, and this was, of course, uh, it, I mean, the medias were you know, talking about my abduction. The, the government at the time, I think, was concerned that because they had withdrawn my, my bodyguards, and they couldn't really explain why they had uh, <laughs> withdrawn my security, then they decided to rewrite the story. And they told the Colombians that I had gone to San Vicente because I was stupid, imprudent, uh, stubborn. Uh, and they would tell the people that they had warned me, that I took the decision at my own risk, and that it was my fault. Well, all of that is not true. I wasn't warned. I took the decision to go because the information I had was, was telling me that it was safe to do it. 
There was helicopters all over the place, soldiers all over the place. The president of Colombia was going to the same place I was going, and he was not kidnapped. Uh, it was impossible for me to just think that, for me and for everybody, I mean, I'm sure that none of the uh, government officials could have foreseen that the FARC was going, was going to dare to install a, a roadblock uh, in that space surrounded with military uh, that same day where the, where, when the president was, was going to the zone. So um, it has been very difficult for me to just, uh, you know, process and accept uh, what happened four or five months ago in Colombia. And it has been very, very painful because um, as a victim, you need to be considered and accepted as a victim. And I'm going to tell you something that is perhaps what, what hurts me the most. I think that Colombia forgot I was a victim. They just began saying me like, uh, this woman that goes in the newspapers all over the world, she's not more of a victim, she's that woman. And they treated me like they never treated Pablo Escobar. Pablo Escobar was never treated like I was. So it hurts. We have time for, for one more question. Uh, do you have an ongoing relationship with any of the people who played key roles in your journey of survival? I think with almost all of them. Um, well, I ha you, you see, the truth is that all my, my companions in captivity are really my family. And, and it's not something just like words that you just throw like this. It's really true. I mean, I speak with them <clears throat> all the time, in, in, in daily basis. And I know where they are, what they're doing. Um, we help each other in many, many ways. Um, so so it's, it's a very strong bondage. Of course, I have no, no relationship with the people that abducted me, especially with the two commanders that were um, uh, caught when, when we, were, we were liberated. Uh, but for them, I, I, I wish them all the best. I mean, I don't have any kind of, um, uh, I think, I, I hope they, they are well, well treated. There's one that is in the United States. He, he was extradited. And the other one uh, is in the Colombian jail. Um, so, so it's important to just, you know, uh, I think that, Part of the healing is to, to just acknowledge your feelings. And, and uh, I have special, very uh, strong feelings with, with, uh, with all those uh, companions that were with me in the jungle. Um, I love them, and they're important for me. Thank you very much, Ingrid. I want to thank Jean and thank Ingrid for an extraordinary and moving conversation. Ingrid, I think we're all so in awe of your strength and your emotion and your tenacity. And just thank you for giving us a window into your experience and sharing all of this with us this evening. Thank you so much. I want to thank all of you for being here with us this evening. Um, if you want to learn more about the museum, there is a table at the back of the room that shares extra information about um, our website, our projects, and our forthcoming events. 
Um, Ingrid is very generously agreed to sign copies of her book. Those are available at the side of the room through our partnership with Book Passage. Um, she's going to be stepping off the stage briefly, but she will be, be back in the room in 10 minutes to do those signatures for you. I'm also really pleased to let you know that there will be a podcast of this conversation available on the museum's website, so please share that with people who couldn't be with us tonight so they can experience this incredible conversation for themselves. Um, so thank you again for your support this evening, but a huge thank you especially to both of you for such an incredible uh, moment and conversation. Thank you so much.